So welcome for this session. This is advanced taxation. I want to give an introduction to the business income because this one forms the basis or the backbone or actually the base of understanding the business income. So, and when we talk about the business income, business income is among the specified sources of income, which is taxable under section three, subsection two of the income tax. And a business can be operated as either a corporation, a sole proprietorship, or as a partnership. Those are three major forms of business. Eh? Think that can be operated as a company, that's the corporation, a sole proprietorship, or as partnership. Now, when I'm making a tax assessment, when we want to determine whether a business is in the nature of trade, what are the sum of the factors you consider? So that's what you call the factors to consider in evaluating whether the business is in the nature of trade. One, uh, you look at the profit motive. Yeah, remember the, um, the major objective of any business is to make profit. So this must be an aligned objective rather than the incidental. Then number two, just look at the nature of the asset acquired and quantities involved. Yeah, the nature of asset acquired. So for example, you cannot buy a lorry and then you claim that this uh, I want this lorry to be a personal car. Uh, so also you look at the method of financing. How are you financing the business? Also the method used to generating sales, such as advertising. Eh? You know what the main objective of advertising is to simulate and foster in more sales. Then you also look at the mode of the acquisition, the mode of acquisition used to finance the business. Now, under business income, now what are the sum of the taxable business income? Now, depending on the nature of the business, just know that all the income which are generated by the business are all taxable. All the income generated by any form of business are taxable. Now, what you just need to know, what are those are non-taxable income? Now, apart from this non-taxable income, all the other income are taxable. So therefore, now let's look at non-taxable income. One, we have income from foreign investment. You have invested in a foreign country. The income earned will be taxed in the country of origin. So therefore, in Kenya, that income will not be taxable. So income from foreign investment. But in this case, don't confuse income from foreign investment with foreign exchange gain and losses. Now, a foreign exchange gain, that one is a taxable income because that's an operational income, day-to-day eh? -day exchanging uh, one currency to another currency on a day-to-day -day operation. So foreign exchange gains are taxable. But income in, uh, uh, originating from foreign investments, those are the income which are not taxable. Then number two, uh, reduction in general provision for doubtful debts, also additional capital introduced. If a partner or in a, the company introduces new capital, you see that's an injection to the company. Right? So that one will not be considered as an income. So therefore, it will not be taxed. Also, capital gain, such as sale of an asset at a gain. If you sell a, an asset at a gain, now that gain will not be taxable. Now, that one has a special tax at a, what we call a capital gain of 5%. So therefore, it will not be considered as a business taxable income. Also, unrealized profit. Unrealized profit are not taxable. Also, dividend income, where an entity has at least 12.5% equity ownership in the other company. If one company controls the other company, more than or 12% at above, that means they have that significant influence. Any dividend which will be received from that entity will not be taxable. Also, on an individual basis, inheritance. Also, number eight, interest from government infrastructure bond with maturity period of more than two years. If a company or individual invests in government corporate bonds, with a maturity period of more than two years. Now, the interest earned will not be taxable. In short, it will be tax free. Huh? Then, interest from the post bank. Also, insurance compensation for non current assets. Now, for example, uh, there was an insurance compensation in relation to an current asset. Now, that insurance compensation will not be taxable. But in case it was insurance compensation for the loss of stock, that one will be a taxable income. Now, those are the non-taxable income. Now, let's repeat again. Income from foreign investment, reduction in general provision for debt, debt, additional capital introduced, capital gain, such as sale of asset. In case you sell any asset again, that gain will not be taxed. Huh? Then we have unrealized profit, profit which has not been realized. Also, we have dividend, where an entity has at least 12.5% of the equity ownership. Also, on an individual basis, inheritance, also dowry. Eh? 
Also interest from government infrastructure bond with maturity period of more than two years. Then we have the interest from post bank and then insurance compensation for our current asset. So now let's go back now to the taxable business income. We have said that all income from the business are taxable, apart from what we have discussed in the non-taxable income. There, what are some of the taxable business income? Any gain arising from selling and buying, that means day-to-day -day operation. Number two, an amount of insurance compensation for the loss or damage of stock. And I've written in bracket that for non current asset is not taxable. Yeah, insurance compensation in addition to loss of stock, that one will be taxable. But in case for an current asset, will not be taxable. Also, bad debt recovered, which were previously considered as allowable when were written off. Yeah, you see bad debt, which are if you written, uh, if you write off bad debt, and then that amount is treated as an expense, eh? and then after a while you recover that amount. Now that amount should be recognized as an income, and that income subjected uh, will be taxed. Also, realized foreign gain. Uh -huh. Yeah, it should be foreign exchange gain. Sorry, this one should be foreign exchange gain. Then balancing charge and trading receipt. So we'll come to discuss that one later. What do you mean by balancing charge and trading receipt? Actually, any income which emanated from day to day operating of any business are taxable. So mainly focus on this non-taxable income. Apart from this non-taxable income, all other income are taxable. Now, when preparing the income statement or taxable statement, so you take the taxable income, you raise allowable expenses. Now, which are those allowable expenses? Also for the expenses, note that all expenses are allowable. In short, they reduce the amount of taxable amount, therefore reducing your tax liability. All expenses from day-to-day -day operation, from day-to-day -day operation are allowable. So what you need to know in this case is the disallowable deduction. Now, what are the expenses which are the revenue authority? will deem them to be not day-to-day -day operation, which are be disallowed. Eh? Do not consider them when determining the taxable profit. Now let's look at disallowable deduction. These are expenses not wholly or ex exclusively incurred on day-to-day -day operating income generating. And what are those disallowable deductions? One is capital expenditure on acquisition of current asset. For example, if you buy a motor vehicle, you see that one is a capital expenditure. You don't take it to the income statement. So that one will qualify for what you call investment allowance or capital allowance. So therefore, it's a desirable expense. Depreciation, impairment, and amortization. Those are non-cash expenses. So they are, they are just provisional. So therefore, they are not exp actual expenses. So therefore, they are desirable. Personal and private expenses. Yeah, personal and private expenses. Now, for example, a company. A company might decide to pay school fees for directors' children. So in that case, that one is not a business expense. That one is a personal or a private expense. Then number four, we have general provision for bad debt. Yeah, general provision for bad debt. You see, this one is just a provision. So that one will be desirable. But in case it's a specific bad debt, that one becomes allowable expense. So you think that for general provision is desirable, but it only be allowable when it's specific. That means you have confirmed them. Then number five, all provision, all provision are desirable expenses because provision is not an actual outflow, so therefore will be deemed as a desirable expense. Also, all tax related expenses are deemed to be they are desirable. Then, legal fees and other professional fees of capital nature, all those expenses which are legal fees which are of capital nature, in relation number one to borrowing, valuation of property, and preparation of partnership deeds including preparation of MOA, that's memorandum of acquisition. Yeah, those expenses are desirable. Number eight, capital repairs, including cost of extension and uh, replacement. Yeah, when you talk about the capital repair, if you have a motor vehicle and you need to replace, uh, for example, the engine, now that's what we call a capital repair. Or you have a building, you want to do an extension, or for example, tiling, eh? putting tile in your building. So. That one is considered as a capital expenditure, and therefore it will be a desirable expense. Fines and penalties. Actually, all expenses of wrongdoing are desirable expenses. And then number 10, other expenses regarded as non-business, such as donation. The donation is non-business, so therefore it will be desirable expense. 
Uh, but donations sometimes can be allowable, and it will only be allowable if they are made to the charitable organization. Yeah, donation, let me repeat again. You think that donations should only be allowable expense only when they are made to the charitable organization. So donations are allowable, except in the following circumstances. I mean, uh, the donations are not allowable, except in the following circumstances. Number one, when are the donations allowable? Number one, when the donation is to the charitable organization, such as church, orphanage, or that. Yeah? Then when the taxpayer provides evidence of donation payment, also donation provided can be quantified in monetary value. Also where a donor cannot claim a refund, and then the donor is not benefiting in uh, any way in monetary terms. Eh? Now, for, ex uh, for example, if you donate to a political party, donation for political uh, to a political party. Now, in that case, you see, therefore, it's not for a type of organization. So, therefore, it will be deemed as an expense. Also, for example, when politicians donate, uh, maybe uh, shares, maybe to Buddha riders. Can that amount be treated as a donation? Can it be treated as a rubber expense? Yeah. Donation to Mama Bogas, all that, eh? by a politician. So that one will depend. But mostly uh, that one will be a desirable expense. Why? Or that's on an individual basis. For a company, at least that one you can accept. Eh? But for an individual basis, you see that one, you think that the point number, number five, that the donor is not benefiting in any way in monetary terms. Now what politicians do, they expect something in return. They cannot provide all those ones for free. Eh? Not unless it's a company. For companies, sometimes they have donations in terms of CRC, eh? that giving back to the society. Good, so now let me take you back now to allowable expenses. We see that all expenses emanated from day-to-day -day business are allowable, apart from what we have discussed as desirable expenses. And for desirable, now let me just highlight the major expenses. Capital expenditure, Depreciation, impairment, and amortization, they are desirable. All personal expenses, general provision for doubtful debts, that one is desirable. It only be allowable when it's specific. Then you see that all provision, all provision are desirable expense, tax related expenses, and all expenses of wrongdoing. Now let's look at some of the allowable expenses. And they are expenses which are wholly and, ex uh, wholly and exclusively incurred in the production of income. Yeah, that means the expenses incurred on a day-to-day -day operation. Eh? And the guiding principle is subject to the provision of the Income Tax Act. They include, number one, specific trade bad debt. Yeah, bad debt, they are those bad debt that you have already confirmed will not be recovered. Then number two, we have capital allowances, also known as the investment allowances. So I will come and discuss that on that. Also subscription to a trade association. Legal cost in connection with acquisition of lease, not more than 99 years. Now, legal fees for more than 100 years will be desirable expense. Interest on loan for business development, yeah, interest therefore is allowable expense. Marketing and advertising expense, rose brought forward from previous year with a limit of four years. But this one I can't discuss more. Eh? Yeah, you see, if you make a loss, loss is not taxable, but can be carried uh, with a limit of four years. But this one is prone to adjustment, prone to adjustment. Then legal fees paid on listing securities, costs incurred in preventing soil erosion, scientific research, and uh, related to the business. Yeah, uh, ATC. Good. So those are the sum of the arable expenses. Now, another thing I want to mention. Yeah, you see, I've said that interest on loan for development, uh, for business development, that one is okay. Now, on an individual basis, sometime uh, you might take a mortgage. If you take a mortgage, the interest on mortgage will be allowable, but it has a cap. It has the maximum restriction. Before it used to be 150,000 per annum, but nowadays has been increased. That cap has increased to 300,000 per annum. So kindly, you need to note that, eh? that the mortgage interest is allowable expenses, but with a restriction of 300,000 per annum. That means 25,000 per month. 25,000 per month, good. All right, so now we have discussed about all the taxable income and taxable income, allowable expenses, desirable expenses, good. Now let's look at specified sources of income. Now for tax purposes, incomes are classified into various categories. 
One, we have business income. Now, business income, in, a, in, a, in other words, they are day-to-day -day incomes. For example, for a bank, their business income is what they, uh, they get from day-to-day -day operations, such as commission, uh, fees, interest on loans, all that. In case, uh, for example, it's a school, school, their business income are the fees charged to the student. Uh -huh. Now, in case of an insurance, insurance, their business income is the income they get from day-to-day -day operations, such as what? For the insurance, the major source of income are the premium, uh -huh. commission seeded, all that. Then another specified source of income is the employment income. Then we have property income, such as rental income and loyalties, rental income and loyalties. Also, the other category is investment income, such as dividend income and interest income. Also, we have agricultural or farming income, and then income from past employment, such as pension. Now, those are the specified sources of income. Business income, employment income, property income, such as rental income and royalties, investment income, that's dividend and uh, interest income. And then also we have agricultural or farming income, and then we have income from past employment. Good, so those are the specified sources of income. Now this one will get you on when, uh, when preparing or determining the taxable income. Good. Now let's look at taxation of sole proprietorship. Now, sole proprietorship and partnership, their tax basis is almost the same because, now we usually say in Campanello that, or not just in company, yeah, in companies act, that a sole proprietorship or a partnership has no separate legal identity from the partners or from the owners, as opposed to the company. Now, a company has a separate legal identity separate from the owners. Yeah, for a company, one is an, a natural person, the other one is an artificial person. So therefore, how do we tax sole proprietorship? Now, a sole proprietorship does not have separate taxable capacity and the profit are taxed on owners using the graduated scale rate of tax. Yeah, the one you used to file your PE, eh? that's what you call the graduated scale rate of tax. Now, salaries paid to owners, personal expenses and drawings are not allowable expenses. So any expenses, for example, assuming this is your business, it's a sole proprietorship. And then you have other employees and you are the owner. And then you are the owner, you have or you're entitled to salary. Now that salary will be regarded as a disallowable expense. Why? Because we are saying that, a partner, a sole proprietor, in the business, there is no separate legal identity. You are sharing the same identity. So therefore, you cannot pay yourself. Eh? So because the company, uh, I mean the business, and you, you are sharing the same identity. So therefore, the salary paid to owner is allowable. Personal expenses and drawings are not allowable expense. Therefore, and also, any capital introduced will not be taxable. How do we tax partnership? Now, a partnership does not have separate taxable capacity and the profit are taxed on partners using the graduated scale rate of tax. Now, each partner will be taxed on aggregate of the following from the partnership. One, any form of remuneration from business, that's in case of partnership, eh? any form of remuneration from business, such as salary, bonuses, commission. Then you take the interest on capital, then you deduct interest on drawing. And then from there, the profit share from the business after adjusting number one and number two. Now I want to show you that, yeah. In case of partnership business, this is how we allocate the partner's uh, schedule to determine the taxable amount. So assuming you have two partners, partner X and partner Y, you take the remuneration, a remuneration that such as salaries on wages, you add for the two partners to get the total. Then you add the interest on capital. The capital they provided, sometimes they may be entitled to that interest which is an income to them. So you add that, then you deduct interest on capital. Uh, sorry, in, sorry, this one should be interest on drawings, sorry, not interest on capital. You add interest on capital, you raise interest on drawings. Eh? This one should be interest on drawings. Good. Then once you get that, once you adjust that, from the profit, I mean from the business, from the income statement you have prepared, you determine the profit or loss, then you share among them. In case it's a profit, you show a profit share. In case from the business there was a loss, you show that loss. Eh? And then you get the adjusted taxable profit. Now, once you get the adjusted taxable profit, now this is the profit from business now. Then you think that there is no separate legal identity between the partners and the organization. 
So any other income they earn from other sources, not within the business, also should be aggregated here. So you add other income, such as farming income, rental income, uh, royalties, all that, and employment income, then you get the total. Now, once you get the total, now they'll file individual tax using the graduated scale rate of tax. Cool. So in case of partnership, that's how uh, we tax. Good, so now let's look at taxation of corporation. Yeah, we have said that a company has a separate legal identity. That is, it has a separate taxable capacity. Now, all profits are taxed at the rate of 30% for resident company and 37.5% for non-resident company. So, uh, the tax rate for Kenyan company is 30%, not unless it's subject to change, but for foreign country, uh, for foreign or non-resident company, they pay tax at 37.5%. That means any companies which was not incorporated in Kenya, but it's operating in Kenya, be it a branch, be it or a whole. So their tax rate, they pay the tax at the rate of that 7.5% of their taxable profit. Then transactions between business and shareholders are considered to be business transactions. Between business and shareholders. You see, in this case, we have said that there is that separate legal identity. But in case it's a sole proprietorship, any transaction between the part, uh, between the owner and the business, that one will not be considered as a business transaction because for them there is no separate legal identity. Director salary is allowable expense. Assuming this director is one of the major shareholders, so the salary to him is allowable expense. But we have said that in case of a partnership or a sole proprietorship, the salary to partner or salary to uh, sole proprietor is a disallowable expense. Good. Now, how do we determine the taxable profit? Eh? Determination of taxable profit or loss. Yeah, in determining taxable income for the period, the following two formats are adopted. So we have two formats you can use to determine the taxable profit. One, it's a case of incomplete record. Incomplete record, that means that you are not given the income statement. Whenever you're not given the income statement, you are the one to determine what are the taxable income, what are the allowable expenses. So in that case, you will take sales, you raise cost of sale to get the gross profit. Once you get the gross profit, you add other operating taxable income, not just all the income, all other operating taxable income. Then you deduct allowable expense. Not all expense, but only those allowable expense. And that's how you get the taxable profit. Now this taxable profit is what now we call the business income. Now once you get the business income, now you can add specified sources of income. And you see that specified include investment income, such as dividends, interest, also, you have property income such as rent or income, royalty, etc. And that's how you get the adjusted taxable profit. Alternatively, also in case of incomplete record, this one format will depend on the nature of the business. Now, for example, uh, for a bank, you don't expect bank to have sales. So for them, it's interest maybe on loans. Eh? For the expenses, it's interest on, uh, uh, interest on customer deposit, like that. So you take the income minus the expenses. Then the other format you can adopt is in case of complete record. Now, when you talk about complete record, this is where you are already given the income statement. The accountant has already prepared the income statement. Now, it's upon you now, as a tax person, you want now to determine of this income statement, I want just to extract not the accounting profit, but now the taxable profit. So in this case, you'll start, you apply the bottom-up approach. Eh? You start from the uh, reported profit. Then from the profit, you add back desirable expenses if you have some expenses that an account, uh, accountant had already did, uh, reduced, uh, had already uh, considered in the income statement, for example, depreciation, provision, all that, eh? but in this case, they are deemed as desirable. So you add back those expenses, which has been deducted as an expense. Then once you add back desirable expenses, you raise allowable deduction never deducted. Which are these? This one actually is almost all, always one. Eh? That is investment allowance such as capital allowances or way in tier. Then you also raise an taxable income. So under this reported profit, they had already included all the income. But of those income, which are not taxable, you eliminate them. Also, you need to eliminate specified sources of income, such as rental income. Eh? You eliminate them so that now you can just be able to get the taxable profit or the profit emanated from day-to-day -day operation. Now, once you get that, now you can add back specified sources of income. You deduct specified sources of income for you to get business income, and then you add them as a separate item. Why do you usually do this? 
We usually do adopt this so as because this is what happened. You cannot offset one source of income against another source of income. This is what I mean. If from day to day operation you made a profit of maybe 20 million, and then from rent to income you made a loss, you cannot offset. For example, you cannot take that 20 million profit and then from rent to income you made a loss of 10. You take 20 million minus 10 for you to get total income. No, 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 no. You cannot offset one source of income against another source of income. Good. So those are the two formats you can adopt when uh, determining the taxable uh, profit. Then, uh, lastly, I want to look at something else, what we call the installment tax. Installment tax. Now, what is installment tax? Now, installment tax, or how do the company actually do file their tax? The company does not pay just tax at the end of the financial year, no. By the end of the financial year, the company ought to have already paid all the tax liability for the period. How do they determine? So, this is a method used by the revenue authority to ensure that all taxes are paid by the end of the year of income. They are filed by the taxpayer and all companies are subjected to installment tax return. Individual with the tax liability of more than 40 million, sorry, 40,000 per annum, and from other sources apart, apart from the employment income should also file installment tax return. Not just the company are subjected to installment uh, tax. Even as an individual, if you are earning more than 40,000 per month from other sources other than the employment income, you should also file uh, your installment tax. How do we determine? Now, for example, assuming your company, the year starts uh, on 1st of January and year ends on, the financial year ends on that part of December. Now, assuming the financial year 2021, by 2022, you are already, by the, uh, at January, in January, you are supposed to determine how much tax you are supposed to pay for this now financial year, 2022, the entire year. How do you determine that? Now, this is the formula to determine the amount of tax you are supposed to pay. You will take the previous year tax. Now, the assumption of the revenue authority is that the tax liability will increase by 10%. So you take the previous year tax, then you multiply by one, 10%, then you determine the amount. When you determine the amount, that's now what you pay into four installments. That means quarterly. The tax will be due on or before 20th of the number one, fourth month, that's April, you pay 25%. Sixth month, that's in June, 25%. Nine months, that's on September, 25%. And then December, on before 12 months, that's December, you pay 25%. So that's how you file installment tax. So that to determine, you take the previous year tax, you multiply by one 10% to determine how much tax are you supposed to pay for the coming financial year. And then that amount should be paid on or before 20th of the fourth month, April, that's 25%. Sixth month, June, 25%. Ninth month, that's on September, 25%, and then 12 months, that's 25%. As simple as that. Now, there is also something else we had already discussed, and that was all about... Uh, mm -hmm. So, it was all about arable expenses. And for arable expenses, uh, we had uh, investment allowance. So, now, in your videos, other videos, there is something I have not adjusted, but now this is a new tax rate we are supposed to use, not the tax rate. Eh? Now, this will only talk about the graduated scale rate. Now, this is what we call the graduated scale rate. Eh? It's what a partner or an individual use to file uh, their individual tax return. This is what we call the graduated scale rate. Eh? Here we have the monthly pay, here we have the annual taxable pay, and the rate of tax in each bracket. Eh? But this one is subject to change. So kind of don't cram this because each sitting, depending on the tax policy for that year, they are prone to change. For example, in this case, between one shilling to 288 per annum, you're supposed to pay 10%. Then above 288,001 to 388, you just get the difference between this one, you take 25. And anything in excess of 388,000 per annum will be subjected to the rate of 30%. Then the personal relief is 2,400 per month. But that one is subject to change. And then per annum is 28,800. Now, another most important thing I want you to get. 
You did, in your arrivals, you did what we call capital allowances. They used to have classes. Eh? For example, we used to have we entire class one, class two, class three, class four. Then the care revenue authority has changed all that policy and they have compiled all those rates. They have simplified all those rates. Eh? And you don't have to cram them because after all, will be provided with these rates, uh, these rates on the first page of your question paper. They also found on the website. Eh? They are known as the investment allowance. Yeah. At investment allowance, you are given the rate of investment allowance and then the residual value. Now let's start with the buildings. Now, in case of a hotel building, you construct a hotel building, it will qualify at the rate of 50% for the first year of use, and then 25% on the residual value per year, reducing balance. That's what it means. The first year, 50%. Then subsequent year, now it will be 25% of the net book value. That's what we call the return down value on reducing balance. Building use for manufacture, that's what we call manufacturing building, the same thing. Hospital building, the same, same. Petroleum or gas storage facility, the same, same. Then we have educational hostel building and all commercial building. Now, what are commercial building? Now, commercial building, they go to shops, uh, conference halls, also things to do with warehouse, showrooms, gym, offices. Now, those are the commercial building. Now, for commercial building it, and educational or hostel building, they qualify at the rate of 10% on reducing balance. So why am I saying this? Now, in other video, I have not adjusted some of the videos eh? uh, in, in the app. So kindly be using the new rates because these rates have just changed. Eh? Now let's be using the new rates. So always, whenever you have a providing for capital allowance or investment allowance, also uh, always be confirming this. Eh? Then that was the first category. The second category, we have machinery. For machinery, we have man, uh, machinery used for manufacture. Also, that one we qualify for 50% for the first year of use, 25 residual value, hospital equipment, ships or aircraft. Also, at 50% for the first year of use, and then 25% uh, reducing balance on residual value. Motor vehicle. Now, before we used to have motor vehicle, the way to classify it too. We had heavy and moving self propelling, and we have other self propelling. But nowadays, they have actually added the new rates. Eh? All of them have been put together. All the motor vehicle provided itself are hard moving. Hmm? Motor vehicle and heavy hard moving equipment is at the rate of 25% per annum on reducing balance. Ships and aircraft, 50% for the first year of use. Then computer software, computer hardware, calculators, copiers, duplication machine, all of them also 25%. Furniture and fittings. Yeah, actually, all the items that used to be way in tier class four, all of them they have gone to ten percent. Eh? Furnitures and fittings. Also, you have partitions, all those items, even curtains. Eh? They qualify at ten percent per annum reducing balance. Telecommunication equipment mm -hmm. such as telephone, Wi-Fi, all those. Eh? Uh -huh. It's ten percent reducing balance. Film equip uh, equipment by local producer, twenty five percent. Machinery used to undertake operation under prospecting rights and exploration under mining rights, uh, such as petroleum items, eh? yeah, oil and tankage, all those. Eh? You see these, eh? for machinery used to undertake operation under prospecting, those are mining, actually the machinery for mining activities, including the petroleum companies, eh? they qualify at the, at the rate of 50%. Actually the same thing as they are building. Eh? You see at the building, petroleum or gas storage facility is the same, same rate, 50%. So before they used to be, uh, they used to be known as what we call qualifying expenditure. And qualifying expenditure before the old rate used to be 20 percent, uh, 20%, eh? but now they have changed to 50 percent for the first year of use and 25 percent on the residual. Then other machinery. Now any other machinery which is not listed here, eh, it's still at the rate of 10 percent. Uh -huh. Then number C, we have parties or acquisition of rights to use fiber optic cable by telecommunication operation is 10%. Then farm works, and this is for the agricultural uh, equipment, eh? is 50% for the year of use. So before there used to be known as diminution, eh? utensil used to be at the rate of 33 and that. Eh? So actually you have nothing to come here because after all you'll be provided with this rate, uh, this, uh, this uh, schedule in your question paper at the first page. Eh? 
Yeah, so now with that, I think that's all about the introduction. In case you have not understood what we have done, kindly can you really watch this video again? Because this forms the basis of taxation, allowable, disallowable expense, all that. Eh? So I wish to stop there. So I hope you have you have something, eh? you have gotten something. So kind of you can defeat this. Eh? And also you have this one in your handout. You have this one in your handout. Eh? So handout from page, uh, you can look from page 10, 11, 12, 13. That's why you have all those notes. Okay, thank you for your time. So now that's all.